Okay, we're gonna pick up where we left off with Indigenous American Unit. So this is the all tokapu tunic from the Inca people, Inca culture, made from camelid fiber and cotton. So this would be worn like a tunic that slit in the top is where you would put your head and then it would just go over you. Um, the textiles were valued as wealth. So tunics were the most valuable of all the textiles. So again, by wearing this, since this is a valuable material, then this would show your wealth and your status. I'm gonna this guy, sorry. Uh, the tokapu, that word tokapu, those are the small rectangular designs. So the more tokapu that you have shows the more power that you have. And this one has a large number of tokapu. So wearing such an elaborate garment would indicate the status of the individual. This one may have been worn by an Incan ruler. Tunics like this were used exclusively by kings. The many different designs are believed to represent different clans and may be a symbol of the ruler's reign as well as the unity of the empire. Tunics like this one were made by sacred female weavers who lived in convent-like settings. So remember we talked about fabric arts or fibers are typically done by the females in the group, in the culture. So the soft materials handled by the females, the harder materials handled by the males. All right, some cross-cultural comparisons. We've got these, so what are they and what do they have in common? So you've got the funeral banner of Lady Di, Lady D, Lady D, I think, uh, the Hiapo Tapa, and then the Bayou Tapestry on the bottom right. So they're all connected because they're fibers, fabric arts. Okay, this one is the bandolier bag from the Delaware people. It's beadwork on leather. Let me skip over a little bit here. Okay, so this work originated from the Lenape tribe, which was part of the larger of a larger nation. Bags like this were symbols of prestige. The style was initially copied from the European settlers' cartridge bags. So this was inspired by military bags that they were seeing by Europeans. They were made by women that to be used for men to wear, although in some clans they were worn by women. In others, they were worn by a woman in honor, to, in honor of a deceased male. They were sometimes used as gifts or trade items. Each one was unique in decoration. The glass beads used to decorate them were acquired from European settlers during trade, and the beads were considered to be a sacred material to the Delaware people. Uh, they held great symbolic value for the natives due to their permanence, bright colors, reflective properties, and round shape. The European settlers regarded these glass beads as a cheap, cheap trade good. Sometimes these would not actually be functional. They would be purely decorative to be worn. Yep, and the bags constructed were of trade cloth, the cotton wool velvet leather, it's all from trade. The bag was held at hip level and the strap would go across the chest. Yep. All right, so what are some cross-cultural connections? So we have the Niobid crater from the Greek unit. And then the navigation chart on the bottom, and then Duchamp's fountain. So these are all connected because at some time or another, they could be considered functional. So the bags could have been functional, although they also could have been decorative. The fountain piece by Duchamp was originally made at the company to be functional, but then he removed the function. Yeah, and then the Niobid crater was used to mix wine with water, they diluted their wine. And then the navigation chart obviously is very functional because it was used to navigate. Okay, this guy, one of my favorites. This is the transformation mask by the Kawaka Waka Waka from Northwest coast of Canada, late 19th century wood, paint and string. So this type of mask is unique to the native people of the Northwest coast. Masks like this one were used in ritual dances that were often part of multi-day potlatches. Potlatches are the, is the name of the specific celebration or gathering during which many tribes would gather together and exchange gifts. Each clan was associated with a sacred animal like a raven, a thunderbird, an eagle, a wolf, a bear, a whale. Masks like this one help preserve and convey traditional stories. Um, so it'd be a dancer, you know, wearing it. And as they are dancing and moving, they would pull the string. And as they pulled the string, the face would open and it would, veal, would reveal either a human or an animal inside that face. And this one has an animal on the outside and then a human on the inside. This relates back to their um, creation myth. 
and their deities that they believe in. So the hidden strings allow the wearer to open and close the mask during the ritual dance. This mask depicts a thunderbird on the outside and a human on the inside. Let me see if this book says anything. This is worn over the head as part of a complete body costume, so it didn't just sit on top. At the moment of transformation, the performer turns his back to the audience to conceal the action and heighten the mystery. Ministry. Okay, I don't have any um, cross-cultural comparisons. Okay, this guy is the Cody Katsi Hyde painting of a Sundance from the Eastern Shoshan, um, Wyoming. Okay, so this one, um, hide paintings like this, whoops, hide paintings like this one were traditionally used as robes. So they would wear them or they would hang them in their, in their teepees as decorations. They are painted with figural or geometric designs on the elk, deer, and buffalo hides by the people of the Plains tribes. This one affirmed native identity by combining the narratives of the buffalo hunt with the wolf dance. It depicts an earlier time. So he's depicting an earlier time versus when he is when buffalo were plentiful and warriors hunted with bows and arrows. Parts of the ceremony depicted were outlawed by the US government at the time this object was made. And the combination of different sacred ceremonies was meant to attract a buyer and was most likely intended to be sold to tourists. So this is at a time where they were removed from their land and put on reservations. So he's trying to appeal to tourists so that he can make money for his community. So, in appealing to tourists, to tourists, he's depicting like stereotypical generic depictions of Native Americans versus what life was actually like at the time. Um, the way he's depicting the people is not very naturalistic or realistic, it's more stylized. And then what could these have in common? Animals, there is a little animal here. These guys are animals, but there's a little animal. Um, remember dogs represent fidelity and he's picking out the, it's like a piece of clothing either from him or from the other lady he's with. So he, the dog is like picking out the infidelity. Okay, I think this is our last one. This is Black on Black Ceramic Vessel by Maria Martinez. I don't think I have the title on there, sorry. Um, and her husband, Julian Martinez, but she's the most important one, Maria Martinez, from the Pueblo in New Mexico, uh, mid 20th century, blackware ceramic. So Julian Martinez was part, that's the husband, was part of a mid 20th century Puebloan excavation team while Maria Martinez cooked for the team. They both studied the ancient black on black pottery found during the excavation. After much experimentation, they found a way to create similar works using a low oxygen environment. Maria made the vessels and she made these all by hand. These are coil pots. Um, so she would not use a machine. They're not, she's not using a wheel. She's actually sculpting them by hand. Maria made the vessels and then her husband Julian painted them. Others helped in the preparation and creation of each vessel. Each artisan added their signature to each piece they worked on. And that was to help bring in money to the community. The, because she became so famous that people wanted to buy the pots that had her name on it. They shared the style with the Pueblo people and it became a popular and sought after commodity. Most of the vessels were made for sale and the unique style brought fame and money to her community. So that was her, that was their goal was to help provide for the community, not just for her. Um, form, there's a lot of contrast between the matte parts of the glaze and the shiny parts of the glaze. At the time of production, this is some context, the Pueblos were in decline and modern life is replacing the traditional life. And because of the railroad um, being built, it actually brought a lot of tourists into New Mexico and through her community. So they, they think this stuff is neat. They like the idea of the older traditions of the native Pueblo um, people, the Anasazi people. And so they want to buy art that reflects the native traditions. Okay, cross-cultural comparisons. Don't think too deep here. This is just about color. So these all, whoop, these all just have like a very monochromatic or limited color palettes. You've got the Shiva Lord of Dance on the right, the Mblo mask from Africa with the crowns on the top in the middle, and then the Ai Weiwei from the, um, at the end, what's that called? Contemporary unit, sunflower seeds. All right, here's a list of vocabulary from Native American if you guys wanna pause and look over that. All right, I hope that helped you guys. Adios.